Okay, welcome back. My name is Shalina with Rising Woman, and today I am here with Dr. Lauren Vogel Mercy. And Lauren, you are a sex therapist, and you love to work with couples and individuals, especially in the realms of libido and desire. And so today we're going to have a conversation about that. Um, I'd love for you to just introduce yourself and share a bit about your work and what it's like for you to be in that realm. Sure. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Um, so I am a, um, a licensed psychologist by uh, training. So um, my years in formal education were spent learning um, clinical psychology. And then I went on to specialize in um, human sexuality and also uh, some specialization in gender as well. Um, and I did that at the uh, University of Minnesota, which is where I ended up staying. So I'm uh, currently in Minneapolis. And so for the past several years, I've been working with individuals and couples around their relationship and sexual health concerns, as well as uh, part of my practice comes in for, um, you know, issues around gender identity. Awesome. Thanks for sharing that. And what is it that drew you to working in these realms in particular? You know, I always get asked that question. I, I knew at a young age that I wanted to be a therapist. Um, and when I was a teenager, I just found that I had such a curiosity about sexuality and noticed that a lot of people didn't talk about it very openly. There wasn't, uh, at least for me, a lot of formal education around sexuality. And I just noticed that it was an area of budding, you know, question for me, like, what are people doing? What's normal? What's not normal? And so I found that I was sort of seeking out resources on my own and, um, you know, books that were geared towards, you know, teen girls, things like this. And I would constantly be asking friends questions, things, you know, of that nature around sex and relationships. And so um, as I continued in my formal education, I realized that there was something that stood out about that compared to some of my colleagues that I had, it seemed like more comfort talking about some of those areas than some of my uh, friends in graduate school did. And so it seemed like sort of a natural progression for me if it's such an area of comfort where for some others it's an area of discomfort, that that might be a strength and an area for me to further explore. For sure. And I think sex has always been and probably will always be to some extent taboo. So when you notice that inclination towards talking about it and exploring it, it's important to embrace that because we need safe people like you who we can come to and talk about it with and really liberate ourselves from some of those old stories that we might have attached to our sexuality. So thanks for stepping into that. I appreciate it. Thank you. It felt uh, somewhat like a calling for me that it just sort of evolved in that direction. That's cool. Did you ever, I don't know if you guys have this in the US, but in Canada here we had a show called the Sunday Night Sex Show when I was a kid. Have you ever heard of it? So I was raised in Toronto, actually. <laughs> okay. So I was very familiar with, uh, with Sue Johansson and the Sunday Night Sex Show. And yeah, we would watch that sometimes in high school and, you know, kind of giggle about the things that people were talking about. And I had some friends who would, you know, try to call in and try to get on air with their questions. So yeah, very familiar. Yeah, I loved that show. I thought she was amazing. Just so casual and silly and fun and direct about sexuality and yeah I loved it it's very fun basically the Canadian equivalent to like a Dr. Ruth totally <laughs> cool so today we're going to kind of talk about those two subjects that you had brought up in the beginning with me which was um the issue that comes up for almost every couple which is one person has higher desire one person has lower desire and then we're going to kind of talk a little bit about what might be coming up uh, or what the blocks might be when we're experiencing low desire within ourselves and just how to navigate that. And I think that that's a question that probably all of us have, especially those of us in long term relationships or marriages, because, you know, we go through the honeymoon phase and everything is really sexual and passionate. And then when you get into day to day life, maybe all of a sudden it's like the switch is just off. And yeah. so what's happening there. I think I'm, I'm really fascinated to hear 
your perspective on all of that. Yeah, absolutely. I'd say um, I was actually just reading something. Um, uh, Dr. Lori Brado, who's actually out of UBC, who does a lot of uh, research on desire. Most of her research is with women. Um, but I recently read something that she had posted to social media from her lab that said that the number one complaint or concern that uh, both men and women have around sex is low desire or low libido. So it seems like it's not just, you know, the, the, the story or the narrative is that that's more common in women. But I think what we're finding is that that is the number one complaint when it comes to sexual health, just across the board. There's a number of reasons for that. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to dive deeper into that because there is this idea, I think, in our culture specifically around genders where it we see men as the ones who always want sex and women as the ones who don't. And I think, you know, sometimes that's true, but I I have very close relationships with people in my life. So men and women who we talk really deeply about our relationships together. And so I know from experience that that's really not the case and that it is really genderless in some ways. Like we're all, and I, I think sometimes it actually has to do more with what's going on energetically for us or in our, in our own minds. Um, but I'm curious if you can unpack that for us. Yeah. I mean, I think um, there are so many different variables at any one time that influence our, you know, physical health, our mental health, and then our sexual health. And so it, it can be any number of things. And there are some that are maybe more prevalent than others or more common threads uh, among people. And certainly right now with the way that the world is and the stress and the fear that is going around collectively, that is something that can have a real impact on desire. And I think, you know, what's really interesting is when you understand um, sort of what happens when your body hits survival mode, um, because your body is designed basically to pick between survival mode or a state of calm and safety. And if you're in a state of survival, it's going to be really challenging to experience arousal in your body and even to experience the desire or interest in seeking out a sexual encounter. And that's biologically determined. Um, and it makes a lot of sense when we think about it. Um, you know, our ancestors were often in survival uh, situations where there might have been a predator that showed up or something that was threatening to their safety. And so in those moments, the body is designed to shut off the sexual response so that we can turn on that fight or flight response, take care of ourselves and first seek safety. And then we can resume, you know, seeking out sexuality. So from the way that our nervous system is designed, it's, it's doing that in a very helpful and, um, you know, adaptive uh, way. And so the problem is that in our modern day, um, you know, with the exception of the current viral outbreak, which is where we are finding ourselves right now, um, but with the exception of something like that, most of us are hopefully not in an actual threatening situation. But our bodies don't know sometimes the difference between the day-to-day -day experiences that we have in our digital world and the actual threat of a survival experience from the times from our ancestors. And so our bodies are often, and, and often it's uh, you know subconscious, we're not always so aware at the cognitive level that that's what's happening but our bodies are in the survival mode and we're kind of stuck in that mode. And so when the idea of going to be sexual doesn't make sense or doesn't occur to you, it might be that that is uh, maybe one of the things that could be going on for you. Mm -hmm. That really resonates for me. And I think it makes a lot of sense. I know that when my husband and I are both in our heads or we've been working a lot, we have weekly dates. We have weekly sex dates where we practice Tantra and we eye gaze and we do breath work and we clear anything that needs to be said. Um, and a lot of times it takes us a while 
to even be in our bodies and really feel anything it's almost like we can both go almost numb because we're so in our heads and there's this expectation sometimes that we should just get into it and i think what we don't give ourselves permission to do enough is to really make a long transition almost to have like a landing pad where we can plan the whole day of transitioning like how is it going to be that you get into your body how are you going to get there rather than expecting it to just happen because i think for my husband and I, if we didn't plan, we probably would never, right. because unless we're camping and then we're, you know, away from everything, um, yeah. day to day life, we need to schedule it and we need to design experiences to help us get there. Right. Right. I think, you know, like you said, that transition from the day to day into uh, an intimate or sexual space is often hard to find unless you cultivate it or are intentional about it. And I love this idea and I'm often working with my clients on creating intention and planning around their sexual life because you know, in what other area do we prioritize something and don't have some sort of plan or intent behind it? So there's this very common and, and sometimes hurtful narrative that sex should be spontaneous, that it should always be spontaneous, and that that is sort of the optimal way to be sexual, is that it should just come out of nowhere, just kind of happen on its own, more of like a passive experience. In a movie scene, like slam me up against the wall in the shower, and just like we're with our clothes on. <laughs> right. Right. Except when you think about it, most of the movie scenes that we see that depict these really passionate sex scenes are newer relationships or the dating phase of a relationship. That I mean, I can't even recall a movie that I've seen that was showing a, a partnership that had been established for a period of time that also is showing this really passionate lovemaking. It's usually showing, you know, that courting phase of a relationship or what we call the limerence phase, which is that, you know, first six months to a couple of years, uh, which is, you know, known by most people as the honeymoon phase. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, those media depictions really um, distort this idea that like that's the way it's supposed to be for the long term. And what a lot of people find and feel, you know, kind of miffed about is that that's not their experience once they enter into a long-term committed relationship, that things are busy and there's other things going on and there's stress. And so waiting for this sort of prime opportunity to be intimate, it's like you said, like that might never happen. So we have to be intentional about it. But there's also... Uh, this point like you're making about transition. We need to have something to sort of bridge us into a state of calm and rest and intimacy. Um, so, you know, one thing that I often will recommend for um, couples to try together is like similar to what you're describing, um, you know, cultivating some time, maybe once a week, the frequency you can decide what's best for you. Um, where you're you're setting aside time for intimacy. What I often will recommend though, is a lot of people have heard of, you know, you should schedule sex. And I often add a caveat to that because what can happen is that can itself create some pressure to, okay, you know, at this day, this time, I have to show up and do the following things. And that can end up feeling either like pressure or like an obligation, or that you're just going through motions to check a box. And so what I often will say is, you know, rather than scheduling a specific act at a specific time, what you're doing is you're holding space in your life, on your calendar, in your, you know, weekly routine, that's just for us because that's important and it's a priority. But we're gonna have some flexibility around what that actually looks like because that will allow us to be a yes to something rather than a no to a very fixed script. Because it's often, you know, folks struggling with, I am a no for being intimate or sexual because I feel like if I sign up for it, I'm signing up for a very specific 
experience. And if I'm not up for that very specific experience, then we just default. So it becomes very all or none. Yeah. Yeah. I love that you say that. I've found myself in that exact position as well on some of our days where I felt pressure or, you know, neither of us were feeling it. And it's taken us a while to learn how to navigate that and to communicate it. And, and it just becomes one of those things now where we can sit down and we can just breathe and we're like, let's just, let's just see what it's like to just breathe together and eye gaze for a while. Let's just see like how we're feeling in our bodies. Cause we haven't actually been here all day and then let's check in. And, and if we're not feeling it, then it doesn't have to mean anything. Maybe we just actually just want to chill out and watch a movie, or maybe we want to go walk in the forest or maybe we want to talk, whatever. And then sometimes, you know, the energy is there. And I like that you mentioned the pressure piece because there is this idea that, you know, if we schedule something and we have to get it done, that now it's a task. And that sort of, it does kind of suck the pleasure out of it, doesn't it? When it feels like you have to go have sex now. (laughs) Right. It's not really honoring where you are in that time and space, what your body and soul is needing in that moment. Um, so it's sort of this, this balancing act between, you know, I may not be in like an intimacy space, like mentally, but I can choose to do things and I can be sort of willing to set aside some time to do a practice together. And whether that practice is eye gazing and breathing together, whether it's, you know, holding each other, whether it's a massage session, whether it's more sexual, you get to decide at that time. So sometimes I'll use the metaphor. It's like, you know, make a reservation at a restaurant and keep to your reservation. Even if you're not that hungry, go and sit down at the table. And then when you sit down, then you can pull out a menu. You can look around the room and kind of see what feels good to you. And sometimes you might decide to do what you usually do and get the same things. You know, sometimes it might be, you know, I feel like just something small because I just want to be here with you in this moment. I'm not really here for the food per se. I'm here for the experience of being here with you. So it's, you know, we're, we're holding the date as sort of a sacred space for our relationship, but we're also honoring our individual needs and not feeling pressured or uh, like we don't have the ability to say, this is what works best for me right now. Yeah, and that takes some skill, I think, because as individuals and then in a couple, we can really begin to take things personally and make it about us. So there's, I think there's some cultivation of the inner work and some self-esteem that needs to be laid as a foundation so that we can not only say no in a way that our partner can hear us, but also not take it personally or feel like we've done something wrong if our partner's just not feeling it. So maybe we could speak to that a little bit around how we navigate when one person is into it and the other person isn't. Yeah, I mean, I think that's one of the hardest things. And um, I see that a lot that partners uh, take things more personally when, you know, one person is saying, that's just not the space that I'm in right now. And the other person is thinking, well, what am I doing wrong or why not? Or you're not attracted to me anymore. And kind of creating some of these stories around why that might be happening. And I would say most of the time, it's really not about that. It's not that they've lost attraction. It's not that you did something wrong. It's not that, you know, they don't want to be close with you. It could be that their nervous system is stuck in survival mode. It could be that their mind is racing with 20 other things that they're thinking about. And so, you know, it's a, it's a tricky spot because, you know, you want to be close with a partner, but you also, you know, what I hear from partners with higher desire is they don't really want a partner who's going to just, you know, go through motions and check the box. They want someone who's engaged with them and present with them. And so that's really tricky because you can't, you can't force that. So what I will often do is speak to, you know, kind of breaking down what is being intimate and sexual really about for you? Because if it's really about, and I would say this is for most people, 
it's about doing something that feels good and it's about connecting with your partner mm -hmm. and the connecting with your partner piece is usually you know by and large the primary motivator it's to feel close it's to feel intimate it's to feel seen and if that's the primary motivator then it would seem that that gives you a lot of leverage in terms of what that ends up looking like. So it is some inner work in terms of challenging some of the, these narratives that, you know, if you don't have, you know, penetrative sex at a certain frequency, that that means something, that that is undesirable, or that means that you're losing connection, or, you know, that that means something. Now, for people who are looking to you know, take care of their own needs. So let's say you have the need for more frequent orgasms than what your partner is interested in being part of with you. You have in most relationships, the ability to do that. So you can take care of that need for yourself. And that becomes you taking care of your own sexual needs and, and you know, taking care of your own self in, in a way of self care without placing that expectation on the other person. So what we try not to do is say, you know, I need to have, you know, three orgasms a week and you need to provide that for me. Yeah. Can we go down that rabbit hole a little bit? Um, what's coming to my mind right now is the, the elephant in the room, which is porn. Um, I talk to a lot of couples and everybody's got their own views on it. And I know that this can be a really painful subject for a lot of couples especially where this this desire imbalance is occurring and and then porn is being used um, for that self-pleasure let's just talk about that for a minute because i think that it comes up and it can even be one of the strongest things that comes between a couple mm -hmm. yeah so i mean it's a really you know we, we have to unpack many things when it comes to porn um, there are different layers to that. I'd say the most common thing is, you know, for the partner who discovers that their, you know, loved one is using porn, what can often come up is either if that's something that goes against their value or belief system, uh, particularly if there's some religious convictions or, you know, family, um, you know, values around that. So that can come up where this feels like it's violating their own personal convictions. And then by proxy, it's like, well, if that's my value, I feel like that should be a value for both of us. It can also feel like a turning away from a partner. So if you are turning toward porn, it can sometimes feel like you're turning then away from me or you're not connecting with me. And so that then leads to feelings of betrayal and feelings of um, very deep wound and hurt that you know that's becoming potentially a preferred method or maybe you know something where a partner is then comparing themselves like well I don't look like this image in porn and now it's provoking feelings for me in terms of you know self comparison and body image and not feeling good enough mm -hmm. so are some of these layers to it and then I think there's just a lot of messages out there about pornography we hear everything from how it is addictive to how it can rewire your brain in a really unhealthy way to how you know you shouldn't be using that if you're in a partnership like all of these messages and most of them are external messages telling individuals what they should or shouldn't do with their sexuality Mm -hmm. And I think that's problematic mm -hmm. because, you know, there's a very human, normal uh, component to our sexuality that finds, you know, watching sexual content arousing mm -hmm. and wildly popular among the human species. It's mm -hmm. also popular around other species as well. So, you know, it's a very natural thing to find sexually relevant content to be arousing. And so, you know, some of the things in the layers about unpacking that is, you know, having some open dialogue with a partner about 
what does porn mean to you? What are your values around it? What comes up for you if this is something that's part of my life or your life? And these are very uncomfortable conversations for a lot of people. And so what they end up doing is not talking about it. And then we default to, I'm going to operate based on what I understand the agreement to be. And then you're operating on your understanding. And many times those are two different ways of being. And so that's where people get really stuck is when they find out that, wait a minute, I didn't know that you were doing that. I thought this was okay, or I thought we were on the same page, and they find out that they're not. Yeah, and then it then it's shocking. shocking. Sometimes I'm just watching porn for their whole relationship, but only one of them knew. So having that open dialogue and that open communication, I think, is the most important thing. And I've also witnessed that almost backfiring for a couple because one person wants to be honest and the other person is just so deeply hurt and triggered by what they discover that the person who's revealing their, you know, their desire or that they watch porn might feel like, Oh, well, it's not actually safe for me to share that. So then I, I'm going to go back into hiding. And right. so I see those opportunities actually as really beautiful moments for couples to lean into what's coming up. Because usually there's an abandonment wound, like you said, or a betrayal wound being triggered. And if both of you can stay in the game to just be with what's coming up between you, there's actually a lot of magic that can come out of that and actually probably even a stronger sexual bond. Well, absolutely. And it, it, it is an opportunity to really learn more about your partner and their deeper needs, their deeper values, and even deeper, you know, desires and fantasies. What we get so stuck in is triggering our own stuff and then applying that or projecting that to the other person. So I feel this way. And therefore, if you're my partner, you should feel that way too. And you should operate the way that I operate on this. And so that's where the rift becomes challenging is because we're not sometimes approaching those conversations as two different individuals talking about their own experiences, their own feelings and needs, and then having an open dialogue about that that's more rooted in curiosity and, um, you know, kind of coming at it with fresh eyes. Tell me about your experiences and what is it that you desire and what makes you feel good. We talk about it from our own pain, from our own you know, values from our own uh, judgment. And so that ends up shutting down the conversation. And so that's where working maybe with a therapist, uh, whether that's a relationship therapist or a sex therapist, sometimes that can help with navigating when these defenses or the triggers come up. Absolutely. Because that really shuts down the opportunity for connection. Mm -hmm. It does. And, you know, I've done some coaching with couples around this particular experience. And what I found is that even if there's a big break in trust or a big blow up in the beginning when, you know, the discovery happens or one person wants to be honest and the other person is really hurt, if they both lean into it, then something really cool happens because it's an opportunity, like, as you said, to build a safer container where you really get to know your partner and that in itself, if we can stop trying to get our partner to just be like us and remember that, Hey, we attracted this person because they're not like us. They're so opposite of us in so many ways. That's what excited us in the beginning. So getting curious and remembering it's the wound that wants to control the other person. It's the wound that wants them to be like us. What would it be like to just be fascinated by our partner and genuinely want them to experience pleasure, to give them that freedom and that autonomy to own their sexuality. And then to maybe even explore sexual fantasies together. There's an exercise that couples can do if, if there's, you know, the energy of porn in the relationship where maybe they're not turning toward each other as much as they would like, where you can write down all of your sexual fantasies and then share them with each other. Mm -hmm. And what can happen there is that you might actually find that you are more turned on by each other now because there's nothing that you have to keep secret. There's no shame anymore. It's like liberating it. And it's the secrecy that often drives the shame. And I think it's, it's an important distinction, you know, the difference between secrecy and privacy. 
And those are conversations that are so crucial for couples to have. What what area is just my private life that I get to have for myself because I'm an individual? And what are things that we share with each other because we're in an intimate relationship and we're choosing to be open and honest with each other? And finding that line can be really challenging and it can trigger a lot along the way. And I think, you know, going back to what we were saying earlier about, you know, I can't, you know, kind of make you do things or be the way that I am. It, this is really challenging ego work in some ways, because what we're basically doing is we're having to sit with maybe discomfort, knowing that our partner doesn't share some of the ways that we think of things or do things. And that just because we're in this, you know, uh, bond and relationship doesn't mean that I get to own every part of your sexuality, that you are still an individual. And there might be some things where we're different, just like any other part of our relationship. And there might be discomfort there. There might be wounding there. And so that is something that we can really struggle with. And so then it becomes this sort of surface level um, conflict of whether you should or shouldn't watch porn or whether you're allowed to in your relationship rather than, you know, going deeper into like, what does this mean to you? And, and maybe it's not all or none. Maybe it's not mutually exclusive. How can I honor your need for connection and intimacy and love? How can I also have some autonomy around my body and what I fantasize about and what I do with my private sexuality? Is there room or a way that we can experience both and rather than it feeling like either or? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's such an important distinction to make that piece around uh, control, excuse me, <clears throat> control as well, because in a partnership, what I usually see playing out is one person's abandonment or betrayal wound is triggered and that inadvertently places shame on the other person. And that person's wounds are usually around being shamed or around being told that they're, they need to change or that they're bad, the way that they are isn't okay. And it's just this perfect catalyst for healing to happen. But what happens instead is a lot of couples, they turn on each other in those moments and it's a real make wrong fest instead. And um, so I really love how you keep coming back to this idea of individual autonomy and freedom to have our own sexuality and, and to have our fantasies while also creating that safety to talk about it um, and even making agreements, right? Because obviously there is a difference between having a serious addiction where it's, you know, creating real problems and then just a healthy autonomy where a person just has a strong libido or you know, their own fantasies that they want to indulge in. So do you think that you could talk about that line a little bit? Because I think what happens is a partner who is really against porn isn't able to see the line of if it's healthy or not, because it's all just so confusing and disorienting. It's tough because it's hard for an outside person to tell someone else, you know, what's healthy and unhealthy for them because it's such a, like an internal line. And um, most of us in the, um, the sexual health field, you know, sex therapists and psychologists, we don't even use the term addiction because um, really, if you kind of boil down to it, people who feel like their um, sexual behavior feels out of control or it feels excessive, it's usually an indicator that they're using it for self-soothing. They're using it to regulate their nervous system. It's a way of, you know, kind of escaping what's going on in the world and kind of coming into, you know, this, this ritual that ends up providing some temporary relief. And the problem is that we often will miss that conversation because we're so busy talking about how you maybe shouldn't be doing that or talking about the wounding that's occurring for the other person that we're really missing opportunity to look at the dysregulation that that individual might be experiencing. There's usually distress below that surface. Now, 
that's if the person who's using porn says, I do agree that this is something that feels out of control or it's creating some negative consequences in my life. But you could have two people who say two different things. You know, one person could say, this feels like a norm, normal, healthy sexual outlet. And the other person says, oh, you know, this is a problem and you, you have a problem with it. So um, again, I think that's where a lot of conversation can happen. And sometimes we have to take a step back because what my set point is for what's healthy for me is not necessarily the set point that exists for others, including my partner. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's good to differentiate that. And again, it really does come down to getting curious instead of making judgments and labels. I like that you mentioned the self-soothing part as well. My husband's an addictions counselor. He works with people from all walks of life and works with a lot of men as well who, you know, do come up against this. And one thing that's for certain is that we're all finding ways to soothe our pain. And so as a partner on the other side of it, if you do suspect, you know, that your partner may be you know, overusing something in your life, in their lives, excuse me, then wouldn't it make more sense for us to get curious about, is there an, an imbalance in the relationship itself, right? And that doesn't mean that we need to jump in and fix everything and solve the problem, but can we just get curious more about the energetics, like what's actually happening here, regardless of the story, which is, you know, we're going to always find something to distract us from what's underneath it, like you said, which is the pain. Yeah, and I think, you know, if we're too quick to jump on a bandwagon like, you know, this is an addiction, when it comes to sex, what that ends up looking like is this, this abstinence model that's been adopted from the addiction world that doesn't, you know, well translate to sexuality because sexuality is not this all or none. It's not like, you know, I'm either sexual or I cut it all out. And so what happens is if we approach it with this sort of all or none, um, you know, viewpoint that it can actually increase dysregulation and also increase shame because then you're the problem, your use is, you know, not appropriate. And, and all of that is coming to you externally. It's an outside world telling you what's right and true for you and there, we all know there's no one thing that works for everybody. So, you know, we really have to approach this individually. And to your point, you know, getting curious, what is this doing for you? What does it mean for you? Um, you know, what, what consequences come up from this, if any? Because it's often not the behavior itself. It's the relationship with the behavior. So looking at erotica, finding that arousing and even using that for self-stimulation in and of itself is not necessarily a problem. But if you're using that as a way to numb your feelings, and that means it's at the exclusion of talking to your partner or finding some other ways to regulate, it might be worth looking at. Yeah, and that's the line really is we have to decide for ourselves like one person um, because my husband is an addictions counselor and he is you know always immersed in this realm we we have these little debates about whether or not coffee is addictive and he's always says, well you it can't be an addiction because an addiction is something that prevents you from like being in connection with others and it, it hurts or harms you and your relationships. Like just because you have a dependency doesn't mean you have an addiction. <laughs> we talk about that a lot. I'm like, no, I seriously think I need rehab for coffee. Like it's really bad. Um, like I'm not even kidding. I've had such severe withdrawals. I'm like, how is this not a problem? Uh, but I think that it's something that is unique to each of us. Like some people can drink six cups of coffee a day and be totally fine. And then some right. of us, can't drink coffee at all. And that doesn't mean that. Right. So those are examples of, you know, it's interesting because we will often place different expectations and rules or, or ideas around our sexuality than we do in other areas of our lives. Right. So in, in that example, you know, if one person can drink six cups and perfectly, you know, functional and another person is really sensitive and that would just, you know, really dysregulate them. 
we don't hear people saying, well, I only drink a cup a day. So that's really what you should be doing too. Cause we're in a relationship and that's what we're deciding to do together. You know, because when you think of that, I mean, that sounds kind of ridiculous that just cause I drink this, you should drink this, that it should be the same. But we do this with sexuality. And I think so much of that really comes from the culture that we've been raised in. We're not taught to speak openly about it. We don't ask questions. And most of our education is either coming from erotica or it's coming from Hollywood. So we're not seeing that modeled that, oh yeah, it's perfectly normal that your stimulation, you know, for yourself is different than your self-stimulation, that your desire and frequency of sex that would be more ideal for you is going to be different than it is for you. And, and there's no right or wrong in those things. It's more about navigating the differences. And in that respect, it's no different in a lot of ways than navigating the differences in other areas of the relationship. Yeah, I like that you mentioned that. I think couples could really almost benefit from in the process of building this trust, really having a safe container, like you said, with a therapist, somebody like you who could really guide them into how to have these conversations and how to talk about it. My husband and I just have an agreement. Like we're, we're both very free autonomous individuals. Our sexuality is our own and we love to share that together. And we've made an agreement that if we do self pleasure or if we do want to watch porn or read erotic stories or whatever, that we'll share that with each other when we want to, um, Mm -hmm. but that we're, we're both free. And that, um, if we notice that one of us is moving more towards, you know, something like porn or reading an erotic story rather than going to our partner, that we'll actually choose to go to our partner instead first and see if they're available, um, Mm -hmm. you know, to make an appointment. And that can be something that couples can practice if it feels good for them. It's like, okay, well, if we do feel like there is an imbalance here and we want to work on rebuilding that connection, what if we did try, you know, checking in beforehand or seeing if the other person is available to be intimate instead, um, just to, to create a little bit of that intimacy back into the relationship. Yeah, exactly. And then, you know, going back to earlier where we're talking about like, what is the sex or the intimacy about or for, for you that, you know, let's say one person really is looking more for like an orgasm and having that like energy release and their partner is not interested in participating in that aspect of the experience, but there may be other things that are intimacy building or um, ways to be close together that, you know, okay, you might go do that on your own because that really is not the headspace that I'm in. But then maybe later we can do some eye gazing, we can talk to each other, we can lie in bed together, and we can have some intimacy. And so both of those things can exist. Mm-hmm. And, and again, it doesn't have to be this either or. So if we're open to these conversations, then we can create more space for intimacy if there's more, um, it's, it's broadening the spectrum of like what that looks like. And, and, you know, I think that the hard part is, uh, sort of managing the reactions and the feelings that you have about that. So if you go to your partner and say like, I'm, you know, really feeling sexual, you know, do you want to do this with me? And that person says, you know, I'm really not in that headspace to be able to then manage what that is like for you. And of course, the partner's job is to say that, you know, in a gentle or kind way, because that is, you know, a reaching out, it's a turning toward. And so we want to be, you know, turning toward back, even if that's not a yes, it could be, you know, I, I value our time together. And like right now is not good for me. Can we make some time later for something that's intimate? Yeah, it, it really does come down to learning how to navigate the emotional stuff that comes up because I, it's not easy on either side for either partner, you know, the partner that's really desiring that connection or that even just that sexual release and they just want to experience that with their partner and the partner that really isn't feeling it because there's guilt and pressure involved in that too. One thing I noticed for myself, though, is that because I'm a writer and I'm on the computer a lot, I can really just stay up in my head all day. And so when my husband invites me, sometimes I try to 
just take a pause for a moment and ask what would it be like if I just leaned into this invitation and instead of feeling like I need to do it right now, what would it be like if I said, you know, I'm actually not feeling it yet, but I'd like to try to get there. You know, are you willing to, to participate with me in that? Like, are you willing to join me in seeing if we can get there? And yeah. then I'm still not guaranteeing it's going to happen, but I actually want to extend that to you. I want to give it a try. So maybe we could do some practices or could we go for a walk first? Because I'm just really mental right now and I want to get down here. Yeah. No, I think that's beautiful. And, and it really works with this idea of what we call responsive desire. Um, and this is something that Emily Nagoski talks about in um, one of uh, her books called Come As You Are, which um, if you are it's written for more of a, a female reader, um, highly, highly recommended reading. And she talks about, you know, this difference. We talked earlier about spontaneous desire, feeling like that's sort of the gold standard that we're all trying to achieve. But for a lot of people, that's not really how their sexuality works, or that might be, you know, the spontaneous stuff might be more front loaded at the beginning of a relationship when there's that bonding and forming of the connection. Responsive desire is this idea that we need some context to respond to. We need something to kind of provoke or elicit the response. So if you're just going through your day to day, you're sitting at the computer, there's not much that might be sexually relevant or appealing about that. So if then you know you apply some what you're describing as willingness i'm willing to go try this on or to kind of enter a different space and as we start doing something like going for a walk spending time together touching what might happen is i might start to feel more connected there might be more uh, sexual relevance or appeal and that might turn on my sexual response and then when you're saying to me as we're touching and spending time together you know do you want to be intimate with me in you know a different way do you want to try something else here that might feel like a really different proposition or a really different experience when you're you know lying in bed together touching versus when you're at a computer doing work they're like two totally different things yeah, it, we do need to make time for that transition. And it is, we're each responsible for that. I've talked to people who feel as though it's their partner's job to turn them on and to just be ready for them. And we get a lot of that messaging, even in uh, from certain, you know, spiritual, sexual teachers, like, what would it be like to just be ready for your partner at any moment? And I think that's a really lovely idea. And, and maybe if you live on, you know, a nice piece of land without any, <laughs> any technology, then maybe that's possible. Mm -hmm. For a lot of us, you know, we've got homes and lives and jobs and all of that. And so really honoring that it's our responsibility to know what we need to transition, but also being willing to ask for it and to, and to be willing to extend to it. So, you know, if you know, like, I love being tickled. Mm -hmm my husband tickles my arm or my back for a little bit, it's like all the stress just gone. Mm -hmm. Five minutes of tickling and I'm in my body. Mm -hmm. Then I can really feel desire and I can really feel pleasure, but until I'm there, I can't. And so it's not that he has to do that, but I'm responsible for knowing, okay, this is what helps me. And now I can ask you, can you help me get there? Um, right. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. You know, there is, uh, a lot of empowerment and opportunity in really owning what works for you and owning your, uh, not just orgasms, but what turns you on. And then, you know, being able to communicate that because where a lot of stress and anxiety comes from is this idea of, you know, I have to guess what works for you, what you're in the mood for, what's going to turn you on, what's going to get you there. You know, that is a lot of pressure to try to, you know, take it on as uh, a task or a responsibility almost. Mm -hmm. So as you are discovering, you know, what feels good for you, like tickling, touching, you know, whatever that is, 
you're then verbally communicating that to a partner and saying that feels good. I like it when you do this, this really helps me get, you know, turned on. And then, you know, it's the partner's job to then be receptive to those messages. Now that doesn't always mean that you're going to do that. Uh, maybe not at that moment. Sometimes it might be maybe never depending on what they're asking for. And if that's something that is a boundary or not for you, but if you know and you're listening, then you can offer that, you know, as you're able. Yeah. My women's group and I, we used to do this exercise every once in a while where everybody would pair off into dyads, just two. And uh, they would take turns just giving hand massages and just practicing saying how to touch the hand stronger or harder or lighter or how. And it's incredibly challenging for many of us to really communicate what it is that we desire and what it is we want. And it's a good practice, maybe even in a couple where somebody is not in contact with their voice to start small in those ways with massage or with touch and that, that is totally not sexual and doesn't imply sex. And almost you can create a container where sex is guaranteed not to happen. It's just a safe container to practice asking for what feels good and then we can get there. It's a, it's a beautiful exercise and it's, it's a variation of a type of therapy that I often use with my clients, which is called sensate focus therapy, which is um, Masters and Johnson's therapy style. And so if, for those who are not familiar, those are the um, famous American sex researchers that were doing uh, some of this work in the field of human sexuality research back in like the 50s and 60s. And they found that, you know, if you just, you create sort of that container, it's sort of their rules, like we're, we're not doing something sexual right now. We're just touching for the sake of touch. And to experience that, it's, um, I often liken it to, it's mindful touching, noticing what you are feeling what's coming up for you and uh, the sensate focus the way that i practice it the way that i was trained is that we even take it a step further and not even focus on what feels good but just registering the touch itself so you know it, and there's nothing wrong with focusing on what feels good but if that is maybe not even where you are right now you can take it a step further and just register touch so what is the pressure that you can notice that's being applied? What temperature is, you know, noticed with the touch? What textures are you noticing coming up for you? So starting there, because sometimes we can then have this, you know, sneaky expectation that I'm supposed to feel good from doing this. And then that can kind of add, you know, the exact element that we're trying to stave off. So if we just get back to the foundation of just like, let's just touch for the sake of touch and just tune into the body, that that's often a really nice place to start and to just notice what that's like. And to do that with some of the principles from mindfulness. So we're doing that without judgment and we're doing it with curiosity, just noticing rather than, you know, all of these should statements, like I should be experiencing this and it's supposed to be like that. And why am I not, you know, more turned on, but just noticing, oh, okay. So there's touch and oh, now I'm thinking about work. Let me come back to the touch. Let me keep kind of bringing myself back to the moment. Mm -hmm. That judgment of how we should be feeling. <laughs> That's just the classic pattern that so many of us get in and that's why it feels so horrible most of the time is because we're having a feeling and we're telling ourselves in that moment that that feeling is wrong and that we should be feeling something else and then we're right. so I like that you bring it yeah, back you're all here instead of like in the experience and in your body so it's a practice to be more in your body because when you're in your body, you're going to have a more optimal sexual experience. So, you know, if that's something that's challenging for you, um, what we do find, um, and again, Lori Brado's work at, at UBC, um, people who have just a general mindfulness practice, people who are in general, whether it's practicing a formal meditation or whether they're taking a moment each day to you know, have a ritual where they're just really present in an experience, 
that that will help strengthen the neural pathway, the muscle memory that remembers how to do that. So that when then you go into a sexual experience, you're going to be more apt to transition into your body. Mm-hmm. Now, of course, transitioning into your body is a great thing. And it's also a thing that's really hard, especially for people who have trauma. And so if transitioning into your body, being in your body, being touched is really scary for you, then that would be a really good reason to seek out some uh, therapy and to work with somebody like a coach or a therapist to help you do that in a way that feels safe and that feels uh, more doable because, you know, for some folks with trauma, that is going to sound really triggering. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. I went through a almost a year of somatic experiencing therapy where I was navigating some sexual trauma from the past and my husband and I were in really close communication throughout it because there was for many months I had zero desire to be sexual I didn't want really anything other than just cuddles and connection and and even if we tried to do a tantric practice or a massage I would actually get more triggered and I'd feel a lot of emotion that needed to be moved. And so fortunately we had that container and I could, but there wasn't any pleasure, as you said. And if I was in my head thinking this is supposed to feel good, I would have felt really bad about it. And I like that you mentioned that it's okay to go slow and it's okay to need support. And it makes so much sense that you wouldn't want to go and to be in your body if your body was never safe or if your body had been violated in some way. So really being gentle with ourselves as we navigate that and giving yourself the time. Well, and one of the the saddest things that we see, and it's a common one, is that if you are someone who has experienced trauma, particularly around your body and sexuality, and then you have a partner who wants to be close with you sexually and is getting frustrated and upset and even sometimes angry that that's not happening or it's not feeling like it's meeting their need, then it's like trauma on top of trauma because you're kind of coming into it with a lot of um, you know, sensitive parts and there's some fragile parts to that and it's not already feeling maybe safe to be there. And then if you have a partner who's then, you know, adding on, you know, well, my needs are not being met. This is really frustrating for me. It just creates more of a shutdown. And usually that's, you know, not intentional. And usually it's because partners are also experiencing wounding around not having some of that connection, but it unfortunately uh, often lands where it has the opposite effect, which is that it, it, gets you further from sexual connection because it's just adding more um, discomfort and feeling like, you know, it's not safe to go forward. Yeah, this is why I think it's so important for couples to seek out support from sex therapists and from therapists more in general, because I think there's been some studies that show couples are in crisis for an average of five years before they ever reach out. And that's uh, John Gottman. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. And I think that that's really fascinating because that's a lot of time to struggle together and, and clearly you want to make it work. But by the time you get there, there's been so much fracture in the relationship because when we don't understand the deeper roots. So, you know, it's my husband and I, we started doing therapy together two months into our relationship because we're, we're both nerds, but <laughs> I you know, love it. But a lot of couples, they wait and they think they need to have a a big problem or be on the verge of breakup. But I think it's really, this is sort of an invitation. You're just really inspiring me to extend this to everyone watching. Like if you feel like any of this stuff resonates, like find somebody who can support you because you can really get to the gold in what's coming up between you much quicker with a space holder. Because if we're both feeling hurt and we're both feeling triggered, it's almost impossible to hold space for each other. So right. that's, you need somebody to come hold space for you and then you can really do the work. Right, right. Yeah, because that's often where things get so stuck is I am feeling really triggered and I don't know how to move through that so that I can show up and really 
hear you and then the same thing's happening for the other person and so you're just stuck in gridlock and you can't you know you can't break free of that and then if that grows over time it's you know it's so much easier like if you think of like you know weeding a garden like as the weeds are coming up you just kind of pop them out but oh boy when those weeds i know from first hand experience when they get really big and really overgrown it takes a lot to go in and do some of that weeding and and you know sift through it so um i think you know it, part of that is uh, really breaking the stigma around couples therapy and relationship therapy that it is not reserved for folks who are just on the brink of breaking up that it's a resource and a tool for helping to improve your relationship and how to navigate the ups and downs all along the way yeah and it's it can be a lot of fun it we've had so much fun because when we first started dating we were in these shadow work containers and doing inner child work and talking about you know our past and so we really got to know each other on such a deep level um, I'm studying Imago therapy right now, actually in a training with a Harville Hendricks therapists. And what I love about it is that it's such a gentle dialogue process for couples to deeply understand each other and see each other's vulnerability in that inner child that's still seeking connection, still seeking love, still seeking to be validated. And really having that opportunity, every couple deserves that, no matter what stage they're at. And if you're brand new or if you've been together for 20 years, there's always more to learn because we can sometimes forget to see our partner through a new lens. We think we know everything about them. Like, well, I've got you figured out. And that's, um, that's where the magic stops. So it's like we want to be curious, constantly learning something new. And that's where going to therapy or doing couples workshops can be so liberating for the relationship. Absolutely. And, you know, if, if that feels daunting or overwhelming as a place to start, um, but you're curious about, you know, how can I have a more uh, connected relationship, a safe, uh, emotionally safe relationship, a, a more conscious relationship, you can start with, like you said, there's workshops that you can take. There's also um, a few books that you can read that are really going to help you better understand, you know, how there are certain patterns that we all seem to kind of fall into at some point. And when you become aware and conscious of that, when you name that, then that gives you power of choice. Then you can kind of see yourself as you're stumbling into these patterns and saying, oh, I'm going to back myself up and I want to try that again, or I'm going to go do something to self-soothe so that when I come back, I can be more engaged and present in this conversation with you. So, you know, Harville Hendricks is good uh, for reading about that. Um, you can read, you know, from the John Gottman and Julie Gottman's work and also Sue Johnson's work, which is emotion focused couples therapy. So those would be probably the top three around couples work and even just you know, maybe it feels a little less intimidating to start with reading about it. For sure. Um, Sue Johnson is the Hold Me Tight book. Mm -hmm. And then the Gottman Institute, they have the seven principles of making marriage work was pretty great. And then also the book, I'll put all of these in the show notes as well. Eight Dates is an awesome one, no matter what stage of relationship yeah. you're in. Yes. And, um, Harville Hendricks, they have so many books, but Getting the Love You Want, I thought was awesome, their, their new updated version. And they also have a workbook that you can get on Amazon. Oh, great. Getting the Love You Want workbook. And uh, Ben and I have done their workshops and I'm now training with them. So we're really loving it. And we have a couple friends who are, they're doing the workbook at home instead. And it just walks you through the process and you can do it in your own space. And if you feel like you both have enough safety to hold that for each other, that can be a great place to start. So I'll link those in the, in the notes as well. There's also, um, I haven't looked at it yet, but I, my understanding is that there is a, um, a workbook as well for emotion focused couples therapy that couples can use together. Um, it's not by Sue Johnson, but if you go on something like Amazon, you can find it. I think it's something like, you know, an emotionally focused workbook for couples. I've never been to her workshops. We've been to the John Gottman workshop. We went to one in Seattle last December and it was wonderful. We've never been to any of the Hold Me Tight workshops, but I've heard great things from other couples who have gone, so. 
Yeah, it's, uh, I've been studying the Gottman method for the past four years and um, been doing a lot of training with them and um, working towards certification. And so um, my next venture, I think, is going to be more into um, Sue Johnson's work. And, and I think there's such overlap and such um, uh, continuity between, you know, what uh, Harville Hendricks is doing, what the Gottmans are doing, and what Sue Johnson's doing. So, you know, you're going to get so much benefit. It doesn't really matter where you start. Agreed. Exciting. Those are all my favorite things to geek out on. So. Me too. Meaning. <laughs> awesome. Well, this has been a great conversation. I really appreciate all of the wisdom that you've shared and the way that you've framed things for people today. And um, I learned a lot from you. Is there anything that you want to say before we wrap this up? You know, I think just, you know, starting to have conscious dialogue around sexuality and, and values and needs. And if that's something that you can do while creating a safe container for that, where you can sort of take a step back and really listen and show up for your partner it's really incredible when those conversations can happen and when we can suspend judgment. So, you know, setting up just like, you know, we recommend setting up some time for intimate connection, maybe setting up some time for conversation around this and even dipping a toe in starting with, you know, one or two questions. Um, the Gottmans have a, a mobile app that you can download called the Gottman card decks. Mm. And there, there are questions that you can ask each other about sex. And so you can just read off the card and, you know, use that as a tool to help uh, start the conversation. Beautiful recommendation. Yeah, I love it. Thank you. You're welcome. So I'll put all of these resources in the bottom. And uh, again, Lauren, thank you so much for your time. And uh, I really enjoyed this chat. Thank you so much.